What an amazing, awesome God we serve. Amen. And what a God He is. Philippians chapter 3. And verse 13, very familiar and very applicable here at the beginning of the year. I wanted to preach this to you last Sunday, and then uh, we weren't even here. <laughs> and, uh, and so consider this a New Year's message here at the beginning of 2020. We need to have some foresight now as a church. Verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This is my 11th Sunday morning with you, I believe. But it feels like the first. Because it's a new year. We're really here. And we're looking for God's wisdom and direction and vision as a church in the future. Many have been asking, uh, what direction do we go now uh, as a church? And so, since you're curious, here at the beginning of 2020, let me just tell you. I'm not sure <laughs> exactly, other than uh, I'm going to follow the Lord. And you have indicated that you're going to follow the Lord and the one that He has led to you. And so uh, I don't believe we can go wrong if that's the real leader that we're following as a church. God answered your prayers. He answered our prayers and brought us together for such a time as this. And that is very clear. It is so crystal clear to me that the Lord has um, chosen a certain place and a certain people and a certain time to do some very certain things. And uh, we have great respect for what the Lord has done here over the years. And all the while, and by the way, we reap the benefit now as we come here of all the many years that He, the Lord, and you have poured into this place. We just waltz in and reap a great benefit, okay? And all the while that He was doing things here in you and in your midst, He was doing things in us. And you weren't a part of that at that time, but He was. And it's our prayer that you reap a benefit now, just like we reap a benefit. Um, and mutually together as a team, we see the dream come together. Um, you indicated that you will follow as we lead. Uh, let me challenge you. Do that when you understand. Do that when you don't understand. Do that when you trust me. And do that when you have to trust the God who sent me until you see and understand more. Uh, please follow when you agree and even those times where we may have to agree to disagree. I've got the feeling with this great and loving and wonderful understanding congregation that those times where we agree to disagree will probably be few and far between. But I also know that they will happen. And so let's all follow the leader together uh, as we have some foresight into 2020. This is a great time to grow fo go forward. We personally in ministry have been blessed and privileged to be present in some places where God has done some amazing things. And that gives us confidence uh, that we serve the same God. He will do the same amazing things again. And not because of us. As a matter of fact, His best things that He's done that we've been present for, I'm convinced He did in spite of us. And we're asking Him to do that in spite of us again. To God be the glory. I've heard some good stories here over the years. Some amazing things God has done here. Uh, and to God be the glory for that. And yet this message this morning reminds us that we need to have some foresight. Foresight in 2020. Okay, not hindsight. 
to help us find our way. And here's the first thing we need to find. Are you ready for this? The first thing that we need to find in 2020 is some dissatisfaction. We need to find some dissatisfaction. Hang with me now for a moment. Um, I know that the Bible teaches contentment. We need to be content in things. We talked about Thanksgiving here recently. We're not talking about that kind of satisfaction. When I say we need to find some dissatisfaction, let me illustrate it this way. As we drove here, we were in a caravan of four different vehicles. And um, three of the four vehicles had cruise control, including my big, big U-Haul, pretty neat. Andrew drove another U-Haul that did not have cruise control. Now, how many of you like cruise control? Uh, that's something that we like. On my first visit here, back in late September, was it? Um, I drove my truck up by myself for my first visit here, and my cruise control went out in the first 10 minutes of that trip. Now, keep in mind, these are eight, hour, eight to 10 hour, depending on who's with me, <laughs> one-way trips. <laughs> And this is trip number 11, so what are we up to now? 11 times 8 would be 88, twice that in hours on the road. We're, we're up around the 200 hour point. And anytime I drive my truck, I'm having to do something that no one should ever have to do. Press with my foot <laughs> on a pedal. You wanna talk about just Christian persecution. <laughs> That's the way it's felt. Dissatisfaction says we cannot, as a church, look this way please, we cannot as a church be on cruise control. It takes work, all right? And though we're looking to the Lord to do great things, He's looking at us to work as if it depends on us and to pray as if it depends on Him. We can't be on cruise control. Um, we can't just coast. God isn't pleased when we coast. Now, uh, you just raised your hand. You like cruise control. How many of you really like to relax as you drive? Maybe have a nice drink there. Some people today have the little uh, holder that has, it will chill your drink or, or warm your coffee or whatever. How many of you like to really relax as you drive? That sort of thing. And cruise control, like we said. Um, I want to someday die just like my grandpa in my sleep. Not screaming like the passengers he was driving. <laughs> if we relax too much, we will die. We can't coast through ministry and life as a church. We can't be on cruise control. We need to find some dissatisfaction. And it's okay to say, I'm not satisfied with where my church is at. I want something better. I won't take it personally. How many of you would say, by an uplifted hand today, I'm not satisfied and, and, and just love everything exactly as it is. If you want something better and something more in God's church, raise your hand now all across the room. We need to find that kind of dissatisfaction and not be locked in a comfort zone. All right? A comfort zone. For a church to go backward, it doesn't require people to go backward. It only requires people to stand still. If we are standing still, that's called going backward. We must be going forward. Please don't hit cruise control and get into a comfort zone in your Christian life. Don't allow your church to become just a comfort zone. Now, how many of you think it's too, too warm a, a lot of times here in, in church? It's okay to, it, I need to know this. Okay, so, several say a little too warm. How many of you are too cool sometimes when you come here to church? Okay, so there's some on both sides. And you saw the hands there. You all switch places with each other, okay? <laughs> Whoever just, and, and I'm here to solve problems, all right? We're talking about comfort zones here. We want to be comfortable. These pews look nice and comfortable. You can be comfortable there, but um, we've got to find some dissatisfaction in the ministry and believe in something bigger, something better, and that's what we're talking about. Here's the attitude to have, church. However much I read my Bible last year, it wasn't enough. Can anyone here say, 
I prayed plenty last year and it's enough. No, we need to find some dissatisfaction. However much I served in my church, it was enough. No, I've, I've been approached by so many of you saying, uh, we need you to let loose of the reins and let us do some things. We have ideas, we, we are excited, we want to do some things. That's music to a pastor's ears. You're saying, we've got some dissatisfaction. We need to do something better, bigger and better for God's glory. I'm with you. We're on the same page today. However much I gave last year, it wasn't enough. Now what will it mean if you give more in, the new, in 2020 than you gave in 2019? What might that mean? Somebody? What's that? Maybe you received more. And since the Bible says you actually give first and then you can't outgive God, we can just on faith say, I'm just going to purpose in my heart to give more, not in order to receive, but knowing that he, his shovel's bigger than my shovel and I can dish it out, but uh, I better be ready to take it. That's been our lifelong experience. That can be your experience as well. However much I worshipped last year, it wasn't enough. I'm dissatisfied with it. Like the, the, the songwriter said, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining. What? Every day, still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on, say it with me, higher ground. Find some dissatisfaction. Let's have a great 2020 together. In this new year, our God will want many to take a step up, a step forward. Because listen, to sit and soak and sour <laughs> is not enough. <laughs> that's, not, that's not being a church. That's not what God is worthy of. Sit, soak, sour, no. We're saved to serve. And God's going to challenge you and me to take a step up for Him, not be on cruise control. Did you know that it would have been easier for us to stay where we lived? We had a comfortable... Uh, place. We had a way to be comfortable there, but you know, we would have had to coast. We would have had to be on cruise control. We weren't going to be going forward for the Lord. So He's challenged us. He's challenging you. And why is it we get self-satisfied sometimes? I think it's because we compare ourselves to other people. Sometimes we compare ourselves to someone else who's not necessarily making great strides or great progress, and we say, well, compared to them, I'm doing all right. Well, since when are other people our standard? Shouldn't we be comparing ourselves to Christ? And that's going to always challenge us. People of First Baptist Church, God doesn't offer you Christians. He offers you Christ. Let's get our eyes off of one another. And we, comparing ourselves among ourselves, the Bible says, are not wise. Uh, we develop a false sense of spirituality when we do that. But when we measure next to our great big God, we realize, I've got a long way to go. I need to find some dissatisfaction. In our text, look at verse 13 again. He said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. That word means arrived. Paul said, I have not arrived. And he was perhaps the greatest Christian who ever walked the planet. And he said, I've not arrived. As a matter of fact, he said, I'm the chief of sinners. In other words, he was not on cruise control. I count not myself to have arrived, to have apprehended. Not on cruise control. Put the pedal to the metal. Now, if we're not careful, we can allow ourselves to get to the point of complacency. We can let life beat us down, the failures of yesterday. We can be complacent. I heard of one pastor who pounded the pulpit. He said, we got two problems. Two problems. Ignorance and complacency. Ignorance and complacency. And he said, you, sir, on the front row. You know the difference between ignorance and complacency? And the guy said, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's correct. When is a church officially dead? 
When can we put a sign over the door, Ichabod? When we've looked backwards so long that we can't find it within ourselves to look forward and to look up. We need to find some dissatisfaction. If you're still with me, please say amen. amen. Number two, we need to find, with our foresight, 2020 foresight this year, we need to find some devotion. Not only dissatisfaction, but devotion, which means focus. We need some devotion to something. So our dissatisfaction, that looks backwards and says, no looking back anymore. We're not satisfied with the past, no matter what we've attained, no matter what we've seen happen. And let me tell you just our personal testimony. In our church in Illinois, in 14 years, we were privileged, praise the Lord, to baptize over 400 people. Do I look like I'm satisfied for life now? Aren't there a lot of lost people around here who need to get saved? We can't look back and rest on our laurels. Not when there's lost people all around us. We've got to have some focus. In verse 13, after he said, I count not myself to have apprehended, I'm dissatisfied. He said, but this one thing I do, that's devotion, that's focus for the future. This one thing I do. That's a very important phrase in the Bible, one thing. Because we need to be focused really on one thing. It would be great for you to have one ministry in the church and really, really focus on making that one ministry succeed. Now right now we've got some people that have got a lot of irons in the fire. And they even tell me, I'm doing everything kind of poorly, you know. We're going to ask some of you to step up and take the reins of some of those things. So that person who was doing too much can do one thing really well. This one thing I do, focus some devotion to the self-righteous rich young ruler. Jesus said, one thing thou lackest. He told him to have some devotion, some focus. To busy Martha working in the kitchen, Jesus said, uh, as, and remember she was criticizing her sister Mary who was kneeling at Jesus' feet. What did Jesus say to Martha? Even though she was serving and working so hard, one thing is needful. <laughs> One thing, have some devotion, have some focus. In Psalm 27, 4, David said, One thing have I desired of the Lord. It'd be great to do one thing and do it well. And each member of the body of Christ come together and we'll see a lot of things happen if we each focus with some devotion on our one thing. To the Apostle Paul who made this statement, this one thing I do. Christianity was not just a compartment of his life. It wasn't a side gig. It wasn't a sideshow to him. Think with me of the illustration of a wheel. A wheel has many spokes in it, right? And, and let's say your, your church life is a spoke in the wheel. And your home life is a spoke in the wheel. And you have this hobby, that's another spoke in the wheel. Your school, your work, these are all different spokes in the wheel. The spokes really have nothing to do with each other. Right now, I'm at church, so I'm on the church spoke. Listen, uh, no wonder a lot of us, are, our, our spiritual life doesn't show up at our work, because that's a different spoke. Different spokes for different folks. <laughs> no wonder, no wonder it doesn't show up on the golf course. That's a different spoke. Listen, Jesus doesn't want to be a spoke in the wheel of our life. He deserves to be the hub out of which every spoke is fitted and attached and interconnected with one another. Can I have an amen today? I don't have my sign here. Which of you stole my amen sign? <laughs> we won't need it if you keep this up, though. Jesus wants to be the hub of the wheel. Christianity should not be a compartment of our life, a facet of our life. It should be our life. The hub and all in all. And so perhaps some of you need to trade some commitments of this world to commitment to your Lord. We're too busy these days 
we've got every day completely jam-packed and with all the technology that's supposed to be time-saving for us we're busier than ever as we serve these things these phones and computers and stuff like that instead of letting them serve us we turn and serve them if you have an Apple phone now it'll tell you once a week how many hours per day that you spent on it if you see that it'll shock you did anyone hear that in 2020 Cinco de Mayo falls on a Tuesday Taco Tuesday now why is there a Taco Tuesday we've got it planned out for some people these days, it's McDonald's Monday, Taco Tuesday, Workout Wednesday, T-Ball Thursday, Fishing Friday, Yard Sailing Saturday. No wonder we're sleeping on Sunday. We need to trade some commitments of this world to commitment to our Lord. We need to learn to say no, <laughs> to be less devoted to some things so we may become more devoted where it counts. We need to have some dissatisfaction with some things and find some devotion, some focus. There's only one life which will soon be passed. Finish it with me if you know it. Only what's done for Christ will last. Listen, when I was a child, I laughed and wept and time crept. When I was a youth, I dreamed and talked, and time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. When older still I daily grew, time flew. Soon I shall be traveling on, time gone. No wonder the Bible says, redeem the time. We must redeem the time. We need to be less devoted to some things that are just filling up our life and get devoted to the real thing. We need to find some dissatisfaction from the past. We need to find some devotion for the future. You know the difference between an amateur and a professional? In a simple sense, the difference between an amateur and a professional. An amateur does things from time to time in spurts. A professional devotes themselves full time. It's their life's work. It's everything. It's not a spoke in the wheel. It's the hub. You'll never be effective for the Lord by attending church in spurts. That's right. I said it here at the beginning of the year. You'll never be effective for the Lord by attending church by that faithfulness being in spurts. All right, let's talk about faithfulness for a moment. Let's use an example here. We've got a newlywed. Are you all the newest newlyweds in the church? I believe so. The newest newlyweds in the church right here. So Lee, do me a little favor here and just turn to Caroline and repeat after me, okay? Say, my dear, my dear I, promise I promise with all my heart, all my heart to be faithful to you, faithful to you. in spurts. In spurts. <laughs> How do you like that? <laughs> Spurts is not good enough? Nope. That's not real faithfulness, is it? Lord, help us to be faithful. Really faithful. If we want to go forward as a church, if we want to have this devotion, we need to be dissatisfied with the ways of the past of just being a Sunday morning Christian. Listen, have you ever prayed in spurts? I have. Oh, I have quite a prayer life on the week that I'm moving. Yeah? There's a lot that could go wrong. And then eventually we'll get everything in place and I'll be tempted to let that just be a spurt. You know what I mean? Not be much of a person of prayer then. Bible reading. Let's not do that in spurts. We can't do our giving in spurts. Let's become a people of devotion with a professional mindset. Not amateurs. Professional Christian, 24-7, full-time job. Let me put it another way. This one thing I do. Focus. D.L. Moody, early on in his ministry, was not only a preacher, he was a promoter for big events. 
He was an evangelist who traveled out, was popular with his great preaching. He did YMCA work. He had many irons in the fire. And he preached on one Sunday night at his church to a great crowd. He said, you go home this week if you're not saved and you think about this. I want you to sweat it out each night. And I want you to just think about what would happen if you died. And you come back next Sunday and we'll lead you to the Lord. You'll get saved. But I want you to think about it for a week. It was the week of the great Chicago fire. Thousands died that week, including more than 100 people in his church that he had just preached to. And Moody declared, I will never, ever again preach without giving an invitation and an opportunity to be saved today. Today. And he took all those other irons out of the fire. He stopped doing all these extracurricular things. And you know what he was saying, basically? This one thing I do. I must be dedicated to the cause of Christ, to the gospel, for seeing people get saved. It was then that he shook two continents for God. He had found some dissatisfaction. He found some devotion. And with some 2020 foresight, you know what we need to do? <laughs> exactly that. Number three, and we're almost done, find some direction. Find some direction. Look at verse 14, where Paul said, Forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting those things which are behind. Kimberly and I served right out of Bible college for about three years in Savannah, Georgia. Nearby in Valdosta, Georgia, while we were there, was a track and field prodigy like nobody had ever seen. He set records his freshman year. His sophomore and junior year broke his own records continuously, and he was a shoe-in for huge scholarships in college, the Olympics, all of that. He was the pride of the whole area there. And it was his senior year. He was running a race. He was blowing away the entire field and rounding the fourth turn. He was ahead by more than 20 yards. It was unthinkable how fast this guy was. He turned around, looked over his shoulder, tripped, fell, lost didn't even go to college. It knocked him out of life. <laughs> Forgetting those things which are behind. Jesus said, no man, having put his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit. We've got to go forward. The month of January got its name from Caesar, who named the month after the Roman god Janus, which is a two-faced god, one looking forward, one looking back. We can't be two-faced about this, folks. We can't. And so, in 2020, we need some excellent vision. No looking backward. First Baptist Church, the past is past. No looking back at past sin. He forgives it, he forgets it, so should we. John R. Rice said, no matter what you did in the past, your future is spotless. No looking back. No looking back at past failures. Many New Year's resolutions go in one year and out the other, right? Think of your resolutions from last year. What happened to those? Well, listen, no looking back at those past failures. You only fail when you stop trying. The Bible says a just man falls seven times and rises up again. Babe Ruth held the home run record for many years, but does anybody remember the other record that Babe Ruth held for many years? Strikeouts, Strikeouts right? But just keep trying. If you just... The success is just getting up one time more than the number of times you fall down. Let me tell you about a politician. In 1831, he failed in his business and he went bankrupt. He wanted to be a politician, but he was not. Two years later, he got back on his feet, failed in business again. Two years later, his fiance died. One year later, he had a nervous breakdown. Two years later, he ran for Speaker of the House and was defeated. Two years later, he, was, he ran for elector and was defeated. Three years later, ran for Congress, was defeated. Five years later, ran for Congress, was defeated. Seven years later, ran for Senate, was defeated. <laughs> the next year, he ran on a ticket for vice president and was defeated. 
Two years later, ran for Senate and was again defeated. And two years later, Abraham Lincoln was elected the greatest president, perhaps, who ever lived. He failed over and over and over again and then was a raging success. He moved from one failure to the next without quitting. And Paul said at first, forgetting those things which are behind. Don't let that keep you down. Find some dissatisfaction with that, some devotion, and some direction for the future. No looking back. And church, let me challenge you today. No looking back at past bitterness. If anyone could have been bitter in your Old Testament, it was Joseph who was betrayed by his own brothers. You know what he could have said? I'm in this terrible situation, in this pit, in this prison, because of what others did to me through no fault of my own. But no, Joseph realized that bitterness would only hurt himself. Bitterness is a, is a, is a poison that turns on its creator, its owner. He realized forgiveness is a choice. And so let me challenge you, church, no matter who's hurt you before, don't say that you can't forgive that person who comes to your mind when I'm talking about bitterness right now. Don't say you can't forgive. Just be honest and say you won't forgive. And realize that there will be consequences for that, and they'll all be consequences on you. Free yourself by forgiving someone who didn't ask to be forgiven. Who doesn't even think they did wrong. Forgive someone who did not say sorry. Forgive someone who does not deserve to be forgiven because it frees you. And remember, you didn't deserve to be forgiven by Jesus Christ either. You received it as a gift. No looking back. No looking back. As a church here... We've taken some walks down memory lane. I've read some history that Brother Ed gave me of the church. Fascinating to hear and read about some of these things. Neat to hear about the old building, about the bell tower, and, and other pastors, and, and uh, things like that. Um, we all like to reminisce about the good old days, but we can't allow it to affect our present and our future. We came here... And over these visits that we've made, we've heard a lot about what this town used to have. <laughs> we used to have this business. We used to have this factory. There used to be a Taco Bell here. What happened to that? I want a Taco Bell. We used to have these big name preachers in, I've heard from people. We used to have this many in attendance. Oh, those were the days. But listen, where are we now? It's okay to look back. Let's, let's use those facts to show that God has proven that He can do great things. Yes, let's be aware. And let's be aware that He can do them again. And greater still, if only we'll follow Him in that direction. No good comes from dwelling on the past. People who used to go here. You know what Jesus said to do? Look on the fields that are white unto harvest. There's so many opportunities all around us. Find some dissatisfaction, church. Find some devotion. Find some direction. Oh, and find some determination now. Do you see how he ends in verse 14? I press toward the mark. Determination. It's more than just focus. It's insisting. By God's grace... I want to die trying, if necessary, to go forward for the Lord in this new year and to see my church do great things in the year 2020. I love what the psalmist said in Psalm 65 and verse 11. David said, Thou crownest, uh, go back again there, go crown, Thou crownest the year with Thy goodness. May that be our prayer for this new year. And now, Vision 2020. Where are we going for the future? We're not going to get into all the specifics that are on my mind right now in this moment. But let me just say this. We've been married for 26 and a half years now. We've been in the ministry 
full time for almost all of that. Um, and this move to you good people and to this place has been more challenged by Satan, more complicated by the wicked one, more um, opposed is the word I'm looking for, than we've ever been in any ministry that we've been in. As a matter of fact, we wouldn't be here had we not truly sought the Lord out about, are you closing doors, Lord? Because if you close the door, we'll be happy to, to not go. But is it something else? And the Lord, time after time after time, made it clear. No, the opposition that you're, reach, that you're receiving is from another force that knows that I have some wonderful things in store there when you all get together and get on this same page. And so, in a word, I'm just excited about the future. Let's have some 2020 foresight. And let's commit it to the Lord in prayer right now. With heads bowed and our eyes closed, we're going to have a verse of invitation. And church, I'm asking you, don't do it for me. Does it mean enough to you here at the beginning of the year to get on your knees before your God, what a God He is, and to say, Lord, I'm dissatisfied with my Christian existence. I want something bigger and better. I want to be a better Christian. Lord, I want my church to be seeing soul saved regularly and baptized and discipled and growing because the fields are wide unto harvest. I want to find some devotion. I want to find some direction. Give me that determination. Will you join me this morning at this altar and let's just pray in this new year. We're going to pray as if it all depends on God, for it truly does. And then we're going to get up off of our knees and work at it with His help as if it all depends on us, but praying and trusting in Him. Let's stand to our feet as the music begins to play. That's what I'm asking you to do.